Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to share the screen. Just wait for a few more of you to come in. Um, it was raining today a little bit, but uh, still pretty nice, still pretty warm. I uh, wore a raincoat and was just fine on my bike. So uh, today the plan is I want to talk about uh, projectile motion. Um, I've got a little demo for it. I'm, I'm going to finish off the projectile motion discussion. And then I want to talk about rolling without slipping. And I've got some examples from chapter four. Um, and getting ready for things. I wanted to mention that this week, the Nobel Prize in Physics was announced and an astronomer whom I actually know, Andrea Gez, uh, won it. She, was, uh, she won it for discovering Sagittarius A star. This is the uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so this black hole has a mass of 4.15 uh, million solar masses um, the sun already being 300,000 times more massive than the Earth. And since the black hole, the theory goes that all of that mass is concentrated at the singularity at the center, which is a, just a, like a point, a zero, zero volume and uh, infinite density. And then the Milky Way galaxy consists of about 400 billion stars, the sun of which is one, and the solar system is going around that one little sun, and they're all orbiting around that, that uh, supermassive black hole. So... So she discovered it. Um, she gets a million dollars US, which is good. Uh, also, even more importantly in California, she works at Caltech, there are certain uh, Nobel laureate uh, parking spots that you can get, so, so that's good. Uh, let me look at my Q&A and chat and participants. Please. If there's anything serious going on. Yeah, California. I used to live in California for about six years and they really love their cars in California, I gotta say. It's serious car culture, which is weird because the weather is always perfect for biking. <laughs> so, but no one ever knew why I rode my bike in California. They just, they thought I'd last lost my license to tell you the honest truth. Okay, uh, Professor Maple wanted me to remind you about the help center. She's been staffing this help center with TAs and it's been a little underutilized, but these are the times. Uh, so today from 12.30 to 1.30, there's, there'll be somebody there. Um, then Thursdays, Fridays, Sundays, and also every, the Monday just before the test, uh, any, any midterm assessment, they go on for three hours uh, in the evening, seven to 10. And the basic idea, you kind of raise your hand or your direct message, the TA, you, have, you may have to walk using the arrows to find someone whose uh, first name is TA, or a first name has TA in front of it. So there's that. Uh, also, April wanted me to let you know that, uh, so the, again, there's a midterm assessment on coming up on Tuesday evening, uh, and there's an alternate sitting. So if you're interested in the alternate sitting, um, first of all, if you, there's three things. So I guess there's four things. The first thing I guess would be that if you don't care about the mid, the alternate sitting, you don't have to do anything. So the second thing is that if you wrote the alternate sitting for the first midterm, then you're automatically registered for the alternate sitting for the second midterm. You don't have to do anything. Um, if you did, third thing, if you did not write the alternate sitting for midterm assessment one, but you do need to write the alternate sitting for midterm assessment two for some, some uh, conflict, then you need to fill out that form that April sent a couple of days ago on the announcement. And I guess the fourth thing is that if you, you did write the midterm, the, the alternate sitting on test one, but you, for whatever reason, don't want to write it at 10 p.m. this coming one, then you should just email uh, to us and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll switch you back into the regular sitting. <laughs> Okay, what's everybody doing out there? Um, we're not doing the team up quiz today. It's going to be on Friday. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, a lot of people are asking about the upload format uh, for the quiz, for the midterm assessment. 
Um, I would prefer a PDF or an image, like a JPEG image, something like that. Seems to be easier for my TAs. Right now, my TAs are having a heck of a time with marking it, actually, just in terms of clicking around on Quirkus and, and downloading your images that you uploaded. But they're getting through it. And I'm thinking I might change slightly what the uh, the way that you upload the images on the uh, on the actual midterm. Like you're going to be doing Quirkus, it's going to be half an hour, but I might you know, try to put them both in one upload or something and, sh and show you both questions at the same time. Um, yeah, if you have a test, so any kind of academic conflict uh, is a good reason to to do the alternate setting. Absolutely. It sounds like chemistry has a test that finishes at eight. I mean, you have time, right? You got 10 minutes. It doesn't start till late 10. But uh, I think that's still a pretty good reason to, to give you a couple hours break. Uh, this Monday's Thanksgiving, so that, that means I'm not going to have class on Monday, so that's, that's good to, to know. To know. Let me try this uh, demonstration. Oop, whoa, one more thing. <laughs> um, yeah, someone asked on the, on the Piazza this morning, do we have to write the full subscript every time we refer to a variable? It makes simple equations really long and hard to read. And do we have to put the arrow above vector symbols every time we write as well? That is an excellent question. Um, so... This is the rule that the markers are going to follow when they uh, mark your midterm assessment uh, on Tuesday. The one on two subscripts and the arrows on top of the, the F, the, the force symbol on all the forces on the force diagram have to be there. So this is when you're in the simplify and diagram step. You got it, when you draw your force diagram with all those arrows, you have to include the symbols, the arrows on top, and the whatever it is, one on two, whatever object on. And it should, it's a little redundant because two in each case is going to be always the object you're drawing the force diagram of. But it's good to do it um, and to remind yourself that all these forces are acting on that object because it's easy to get mixed up otherwise. After that, when you get to the represent mathematically step, you can remove the one on two subscripts in order to make it easier to write out the equations. And you will see me doing this a lot when I do the examples. Also, in the equations, you're always dealing with components, right? You're usually the X component or the Y component or something. So in that case, it is appropriate to take off that little arrow symbol to indicate that it's a vector. The vector symbol means that you're actually talking about both components at once. You're talking about direction and, um, and magnitude. Okay. So this is my last thing on projectile motion. Um, and it's, this is a really, really old physics problem from the early 20th century that came up. So it's, it's not very politically correct. And I apologize for that. And it's, it involves, unfortunately, shooting a monkey which I would never ever do. But anyway, the idea is that there's a target. You aim directly at the target. Okay, monkey is hanging from the branch of the tree spotted by a hunter. The barrel of the gun is pointed directly at the monkey. At the exact instant the gun is fired, the monkey lets go of the branch, thinking, oh, I'll, I'll dodge it or something. So the, the question is, will it uh, A, um, go above the monkey, B, go below the monkey, or C, hit the monkey? What do you think? And then I'm going to do the demo. Demo. This is your little prediction, and then we'll see what actually happens. Just while you're still voting, I'll let you know that I have a demonstration with a little blowgun that I'm going to show you, and there's a Roman centurion. You know, they're hanging from an electromagnet. So let's end the polling, and then I'm going to stop my screen share. Okay, so 71% of you who voted, thank you for voting, uh, voted that it's going to hit the monkey. So we'll see if that actually happens. Let's actually give it a try. Um, I have to stop the screen share. Okay, so what I've got, and I'll just put the camera down here for a moment. Let's see if you can see that. It's a little crazy, but what I've got is a... Uh, a Roman centurion was hanging way up here, and this is him. 
and there's a magnet on his head. And so here's a little palm tree and it's an electromagnet. So it's powered by a wire, which is hooked up to a power supply, which is right here. Let me just grab the camera for a second. So there's the power supply. It's right now at five volts and it is connected through uh, a little lead, which goes, uh, which is touching, I guess it goes through this, this metal um, tube right about there. Now there's a ball in this metal tube. And when the ball comes out at that moment, it disconnects the circuit and the Roman centurion should start to fall. And I've got this set up so that it's aimed directly at his chest. You kind of see that he's right up there. And I'm going to blow some air using this super duster right up there and try to hit him. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that I do in my spare time. Okay. You ready? Should we try it? Works. Set. Boom! I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> Ugh. So I got the ball. But it was, it kind of went, I remember I saw it. They hit him right, clink, right in the chest. There's the red ball. I hit him right around there. So if you answered C, you got it right. Just uh, share the screen again here. Mm -hmm. Okay, hit the monkey. Um, and then I also want to do a little more clicking. So thank you to Pius for setting that up. He's uh, my tech guy. And in the past, I've always uh, sort of blown through the blowhole, but he actually uh, suggested I use that duster thing, which is a lot more sanitary, I guess, as well. So the whole idea here is that had the monkey stayed on the tree or had the centurion not started falling at that moment, then the ball would have gone down and actually missed the monkey, and that's due to gravity. The ball would have curved under its target as gravity causes it to fall a distance of one half GT squared below the straight line. So this distance at any point as it goes along grows and grows, and it is one half GT squared. And this is the trajectory if somehow you turned off gravity, I guess. Right, it's the kind of the laser sight or something. But it turns out that if just as the, the ball is released, the monkey releases at that exact time, then one half GT squared is also the distance that the monkey falls. And so it hits, hits the monkey every time. Okay, so now we're getting on to this rolling without slipping. So I'm going to do another poll here. Um, and the question is, a car accelerates away from a stop sign. Okay, so it's accelerating. So there's gotta be a net force on the car. What is the main external force on the car, uh, which provides, I guess the, I guess I should say unbalanced net force. There's gotta be an, un, I mean, there may be some forces that are, uh, that are balanced, but what's the, the main force on the car, which is unbalanced by any other forces and causes it to accelerate? Um, Take a think about that. Oops, let's share, sorry. There we go. Okay, I think I just launched the poll. Is it A, gravity? Is it B, um, what is that? Kinetic friction? Is it uh, C, normal force? Is it D, static friction? Or is it E, thrust? I can only do the demo once, once a semester. Are you not seeing the, uh, the questions? I see an anonymous attendee that's not seeing my screen share, hopefully. Uh, other people are saying it looks fine, so thank you.
right, let's uh, let's end the polling. And then I'll discuss this one uh, a little bit. Like, actually, I think I'm going to go through a little more of a big explanation here. Let's end the polling and just show. So this was very split. I think a lot of you realize that it's friction. Um, and it's something to do with, uh, you have to have an external force. The external forces kind of come from the road somehow. The engine is on. And so there's this idea that it could be thrust. I think actually 17% of you had this idea that it could be the engine. And so, but the thing is the engine is inside the car. So the engine can only provide internal forces on the car itself. If you need something to accelerate in the ground frame, you need an external force. And I think you're right, it does come uh, from friction. Now, let me talk about why I think it's actually D. Okay, <laughs> so this is my rolling without slipping uh, explanation here. I think I got some time. Okay, uh, so this is about rotation. We haven't quite gotten here yet, but basically rotation uh, is when something's turning. So this, uh, the center of the wheel is not moving. The wheel is rotating clockwise. Uh, and the tangential speed of any point on the rim is V relative to the axle. So all these four points, one, two, and three, will be moving in different directions if the whole thing is spinning. Like point one relative to the axle is moving to the right. Point two relative to the axle is moving down. And point three relative to the axle is moving to the left. Okay. And point four is moving up. They're going round and round. So I've just chosen these four points. All the other points would be moving at some diagonal. So that's rotation. Rolling without slipping. So relative to the ground, the axle now is moving towards the right with some velocity V, capital V. And in rolling without slipping, the axle moves at that same speed that all those points were moving, um, like relative, so V1, uh, to A, the absolute value of that is V, and that's going to be the same for all of them. Uh, so if you move the axle at that speed, then what do you have? Well, the top point of the wheel um, relative to the ground will be this, the velocity of one relative to the axle plus the velocity of the axle. These are both V, so it's two times V. In the ground frame, the top point of a rolling wheel moves at speed two times V. Point two, so the right side of the wheel, uh, this is gonna be some sort of a vector equation. The, the velocity of point two relative to the axle is down and the, ax the axle is moving relative to the ground towards the right. So the velocity of point two relative to the ground will be this diagonal down into the right and it'll be the square root uh, of two times V. So now we're at to the bottom point. This is the whole point here is that the bottom of the wheel relative to the axle is moving to the left if the wheel is rotating clockwise. The axle relative to the ground is moving towards the right. So the bottom point relative to the ground is stationary. Those two velocities cancel out and it doesn't move at all. This is kind of a summary here. Relative to the axle, all these one, two, three, four points just go around and around in a circle. Relative to the ground, the top point is moving kind of fast. All the other points are moving in a diagonal and the bottom point is, is at rest relative to the ground. That's kind of the big idea here. So this is called rolling without slipping. The wheel rotates, oops, clockwise, that's wrong. Um, the axle moves with speed V equals V relative to the ground to the right, where V is the tangential speed of the edge of the wheel relative to the axle. Since the bottom point is always at rest, it is static friction, which acts between the ground and the wheel. Let's see if I can have any questions here. So that's why I think the answer is actually D. Um, okay. Let me see. Maybe I should take a couple of hands here. Uh, Ishmam, did you want to unmute? 
rooftop. Yeah, hello, Professor. Hi. Hi. Um, so I had a question about, you know, uh, Newton's, like, on the that axle that on V3, it is at rest. Yeah. So I was thinking if we can apply Newton's third law there, because it is, you know, pushing back the road on the left side. So the road is pushing back the axle on the right side. So that can also be a, you know, reason for, you know, it's accelerating forward, right? That, that is exactly it. Okay. That is exactly how the, uh, how the car accelerates forward. Is it that, is that what's happening here? If you're accelerating is that the wheel pushes backwards on the road with static friction. Um, and then the, by Newton's third law, just as you said, the road pushes forward on the wheel with static friction. And that's what gets the car going. So that's an excellent point. You, in fact, you're, you. a couple, you're a couple slides ahead of me. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> just going to say that. Um, and then uh, Kasha Yar, did you, you had your hand up? Did you want to? Yeah. Hi, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, I can, yeah. So why is uh, uppercase V and lowercase V actually equal in the next, the next slides? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's it, it's equal because otherwise it wouldn't be rolling without slipping. <laughs> so I said it to be equal. So you can imagine something that's just spinning but sitting there, and you can imagine the axle moving any any way it wants. But if it's spinning clockwise like this, or, I mean, clockwise like this, and if you want it to be rolling without slipping, then that lowercase v is the speed that it's that the edge is is moving relative to the axle then you have to set the speed of the axle to be uppercase V equals that, going like that direction to the right in that case. If they're not equal, then it's going to slip? Yeah, you're going to skid. It's going to go or something. <laughs> and that's, uh, that does happen on slippery roads sometimes. But most of the time, uh, when you don't hear your car going screech around, then you know that you're rolling without slipping. And so that is when capital V equals lowercase V. Okay. okay. That's a great point. It's a constraint. It's not, it's not, uh, not obvious. Um, and then another way of looking at this, I just wanted to show you since we're on, I, I made a cool PowerPoint uh, animation. If you can see this. Imagine you have a triangle and you rotate it around this point at the bottom. Watch this. Eee! That point doesn't move. What about a square? You can imagine that rotating around its bottom point. The bottom point doesn't move. What about an octagon? You can imagine that rotating around the bottom point. You know, and it doesn't. The bottom point doesn't move if it's rotating. So you can just go. So that's eight sides. You know, three sides, four sides, eight sides. You can go to infinity sides if you have lots and lots and lots and lots of sides, and it rotates like that around the bottom point. The pivot on the bottom still should not move. Nothing has changed as you increase the number of sides. So you can make it a million zillion sides. Still, the bottom is, is at rest. <laughs> is that... How do you guys feel about that? And then, and then, so getting back to cars again, no matter what the speed of this car is, there are four places, four, on this car that are exactly at rest. And that is the bottoms of these four tires. Can you believe it? And then, so to sort of compensate for that, so let's say the car is going at 100 kilometers per hour, then you've got four points on the bottom of the car that are at rest. You also have four points on the top of those wheels that it's going forward at 200 kilometers per hour because of the way it's spinning. <laughs> anyway, so. And then I think another way of looking at this is that if you think of a tank that's going along, it lays down some tread and then it goes over it and then picks up the tread at the back. So while the tread is on the ground, you can even have like spikes going into the ground. And those are at rest relative to the ground as it goes along. And I think it's the same with rolling without slipping. You're laying down some tire tread and you're picking it up behind. But while it's touching the bottom, the, the bottom part of your tire is not slipping. Um, so that's, so, an under, so the bottom of the wheel is at rest relative to the ground as it rolls. And just to explain why it's D again, the engine provides some kind of torque, which gives the back wheels, in this case, I think it'll be a counterclockwise acceleration. 
The bottom of the tire presses with static friction backwards on the road. And as, uh, as was pointed out by Newton's third law, the road presses forward on the tire with an equal and opposite force. And it's this force right here acting on the car. This is F, well, it's actually, it's, um, it's static friction, so let's write it correctly. This force is F, S, static friction of the road on, um, on the car, I guess, if, this, if you take the system to be the car. Okay? And that's what's pushing that car in the forward direction. That's the, the unbalanced external force on the car which gets it going. And just think, you used to just step on the gas and the car goes and you never thought about it. Well, now you can think of all these things happening. <laughs> okay. Good, good. What time is it? We're doing great for time. Let me actually uh, take a couple of questions. So, Atang, did you have a question? Um, yes, Prof, but it was a question from way, way back at the okay. slide with the uh, monkeys. Uh, so you had spoken that the increase, that if there was no gravity, it would go directly and hit the, um, the monkey if it remained at the top of the, at the top, correct? Yes. Well, if, the, if you turn off gravity, then the initial velocity, V sub zero, would just be like, uh, would be constant, right? There wouldn't be any acceleration. That's what I was thinking. So that dashed line is just the trajectory like if it was out in space or something. Okay, but what if we had an incredibly high, like would, if we had an incredibly high amount of acceleration, would it just pass since it hasn't hit the maximum height yet? What's your question again, sorry? If you have but, a lot of acceleration, oh, so I mean, it might hit the ground before it gets to the monkey, is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is, why would it still hit the monkey, even though, wouldn't the, if we had a higher acceleration, wouldn't yeah. it just go above and hit above the monkey rather than going and hitting the monkey? Well, the so idea is, is with, that they're both um, under free fall, right? So they both have the same acceleration downwards. And whatever the, this Y component of their motion is separate from any kind of X component of their motion. So the the uh, this arrow or bullet or whatever you want to call it that's accelerating below its non gravity path with this one half g t squared distance. Okay. You have to kind of show that. But and then since the monkey is also just in free fall with zero x component of its velocity, it's just going down with one half g t squared because it, it dropped from rest. That's why they always hit every time. Unless I think you're right. I guess if if the gravity is too much, maybe the the arrow or whatever wouldn't make it all the way to the monkey. It'd hit the ground first, in which case um, you've got another force going in there. Okay. All right. There. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And then actually, uh, um, Ezra, you've had your hand up. Let me just find you. Did you want to unmute? Oh, I I just oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. I just had a question like relating to midterm. Yeah, sure. Like, up uploading stuff. Like I have to like convert my files that I like take pictures of like into like PNGs and stuff. So I have to, so that it'll be acceptable on like Quercus and stuff. So would it be possible to like extend the, the test time by like a few minutes so that I'd have time to like convert and upload. What are you taking your, your pictures with? An iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. iPhone saves it in this weird format. And so actually, a lot of people did upload their iPhone photos, and my TAs are doing that conversion right now. <laughs> and it's a real huge headache for them. It's really slowing them down. It's going um, to take them many hours to do that. Um, so I haven't quite figured that out. Um, I do want to keep the test to be within 30, like this 35-minute window or 30-minute window, really, of when, when you're looking at it. Um, uh, and that's, I've got my own reasons for wanting to do that. So <clears throat> I think you need to figure out somehow some faster way of uploading. And I think uploading an image from your phone should be acceptable. I think you shouldn't have to do your own conversion. Oh, it's, right. it's unfortunate my TAs have to convert it. 
it's just weird that iPhones save it in such a weird format. I could get, so I could think about that and try to get you more clear instructions. But um, the issue is not that you should have lots of time to upload. The issue that is that it should be a pretty fast process, like less than a minute to upload an image, I think, to a, to, uh, to a web server, right? <laughs> we got to fix that problem. Okay. Okay. This, that's, these are good good issues, though, and I think there's a lot of stuff on the um, piazza going around and people a little bit concerned about that. It seemed to work for most people. It seemed to just upload an image without an, without an issue, but some people really had a lot of, a lot of trouble with it. PDF, like I say, is kind of like what I would prefer. Notes app on the iPhone to scan the document as PDF. So that's a good idea. Hmm. Some people are talking about using the Notes app on the iPhone to make a, make a file a PDF. That could be a good idea. Okay, so let's think about that a little more. Let's do a couple of quick polls here. Um, did this one already. Okay, there's just a two-part question, and this is talking about a car which has front-wheel drive. So this is the situation. You are sitting in your car, and you step on the gas, and the car accelerates forward. Your car has front-wheel drive. That means that the two front wheels are connected to the engine, but the two back wheels just freely rotate on their axles. They rotate, but they're not connected to the engine. Make sense? They're just on ball bearings or something. As you accelerate, what is the direction of the force of static friction of the road upon the front wheels? Is it, watch the poll. Is it A, forward, B, backward, or C, the static friction on the front wheels is zero. What do you think? And just Thomas Ken, you kind of asked a good question about the midterm alternate sitting. If you have that chemistry test, which ends at um, at 8 p.m., I, I think I'm going to recommend to April Seely that we allow that as being, you know, a conflict, an academic conflict. It seems like not enough time to get your act together for the physics test. So if you want to wait the two hours, then just just let let her know that there's a in your form that you're doing the chemistry test. Okay, so back to this. Uh, force of static friction of the road on the front wheels. Direction. Um, so most of you are saying forward, and I think that's exactly right. I think that is um, what, so if you think of it here, this is, which way does it want to slip? Well, it's going to go, um, the, the, it's going to be accelerating this way clockwise. Um, so the static friction force will be forward in order to stop it from slipping. F for S static friction of the road on, on the front wheels, FW or something. So I like that. And now this is the next question. Um, the question here is what about the rear wheels? What's the direction of the force of static friction on the rear wheels? Difference being they're not hooked up to the engine. Let's give you another uh, 10 seconds to click in, please. Make a choice.
Okay. Um, so this one was <laughs> pretty split. About a third of the class said A, a third of the class said B, and a third of the class said C. So this was a really difficult question. Um, and it, it does have a little bit to do with stuff we haven't covered yet about rotation. So the, the answer, I, I believe, is B. And the reason for it is, um, so this is tricky. Okay. Um, the, the rear wheels um, do rotate as the car accelerates. They keep up with it. They're free to rotate, so they do. The question is why? First of all, what direction do they rotate? Well, they rotate the same as the front wheels. You don't see your back wheels going around, along as you have a front wheel drive. They, they follow along and rotate. So they're not rotating because um, of the engine. Why are they rotating? Well, they would want to slip in this direction. So wants to slip forward if they were stuck or something. And so the static friction force backwards here is F um, of the road static friction on the rear wheels is backwards. It opposes the way they want to slip. And that is actually, that static friction force is what turns these wheels in that direction. In order to get a wheel turning, I guess, clockwise, if you want to push it from the bottom, then you have to push it towards the left. Okay. Um, this uh, backward friction, is small, just enough to um, spin a tire. Okay. Whereas the previous one, the forward one force on the front wheels is very, very large. It's coming, it's actually what's propelling the whole car forward. So you have a forward force on the front wheel, which is huge, and you have a backwards force on the rear wheel, which is very, very small, just enough to spin that tire and keep it from screeching. And that's, so the net force is forward on the car. And then one more example I wanted to do is, uh, in principle, what is the shortest possible amount of time that you can accelerate from zero to 100 kilometers per hour? Now, this is the thing, is it static friction? And I was looking at this rubber on concrete dry. You can actually have a coefficient of static friction of one. And that's the highest number on this table. So, um, okay. In, so this is, the, this is the thing, you've got a car, which is going along like this, car. Um, mass, let's call it mass M. Um, so V initial is zero. V final is 100 kilometers per hour. Um, it might be a good idea to convert that. V is equal to 100 kilometers um, per hour. hour. Let's multiply that times 1,000 meters per uh, kilometer, one kilometer. And we're also gonna multiply that times one hour is 3,600 seconds. It's good to uh, convert it to SI units, right? Kilometer cancels kilometer, um, hour cancels hour, and you end up with uh, the V final is equal to 27.8 meters per second. So that's good to know. And I think it's gonna be static friction here. So if you draw your force diagram on the car, you've got the normal force um, of the, I guess the road on the car. You've got the force of gravity of the earth on the car. And you've got this uh, force of static friction of the road on the car going forwards and it's accelerating forwards. This is an unbalanced forward force on the car. And what I'm gonna do is assume the rubber tire, uh, concrete, dry concrete. Uh, dry concrete from that last 
um, slide, mu sub s equals one. And I'm also, don't forget to define your plus y is up and your plus x is that direction. So I've been careful. I've put the little arrows on top of all the forces. Um, I've put the road on car uh, surface, uh, road on car and earth on car. They're all on the car. So that's that's reminds me I'm doing the, the uh, simplifying diagram. Actually, you know what I just forgot to do? <laughs> I would have lost half a point there. Define um, system is car. That's one way of doing it. Another way you can do it is try to draw kind of like a little dashed line around the car. Sad when the professor loses marks, right? Okay, so good. So then um, the sum of forces in the y direction is, and now I'm gonna drop those subscripts, is normal force minus mg. And that's gonna be equal to zero since the car doesn't accelerate up or down. So that means that the normal force is equal to mg, which is, often the case actually. And then this is since a sub y equals zero. Uh, the sum of forces in the x direction is just the static friction. So I'm gonna assume that's fs max for um, maximum acceleration. Like the, in principle, how fast could this car go? And that's gonna be mu sub s times n. I already solved for n up here, so I plug it in, and I've got, that's mu sub s times m times g. The acceleration in the x direction is the sum of all the x forces divided by the mass of the object, mass of the car. So it's gonna be mu sub s times m times g divided by m. M's cancel. And you've got that a sub x, is equal to mu sub s times g, which equals one times 9.8, <laughs> which equals 9.8. 9.8 meters per second squared is the fastest that in principle a car can accelerate. And so you'll use something like v is equal to v zero um, plus a t, put these all in x, right? Um, this, it starts at zero. So you've got that uh, t is equal to uh, v, x divided by g, uh, you get 27.8 divided by 9.8, and I get 2.8 seconds. Which is fine, but what's interesting is that I looked it up on the web and a Bugatti can do it in 2.7 seconds. According to, that's just like, in, so somehow a Bugatti defies the laws of physics. I'm not quite sure how it does this, but here's my theory. I think it's possible to have static friction uh, coefficient that's greater than one. And you know how I think you can do it? With cleats. If you have cleats, they actually like put little spikes down into the ground. And that's how you can accelerate with more than 9.8 meters per second squared is now it doesn't matter what your normal force is, is as much as you push on the ground, you're gonna get pushed forward without slipping. So maybe it's not this that the engine on the Bugatti is so good, but maybe it's tires are somehow stickier. They're sticking to the ground. And in fact, this reminds me of something. I once knew a guy who had a, um, he did this Formula One racing, he had a race car and he drove it to our house one day to show off to my mom. And he had all these little leaves stuck to the wheels of the car. And that's because this these Formula One racing cars, they have sticky tires. And so normally on a race car and on a track, you don't see it. But when they drive it you know, around the world, then all kinds of stuff gets stuck to those tires. So I think it's possible to have a mu sub s that's even greater than one. Must be how they do it. Leave that up just for a minute. Point one seconds. It's not possible. <laughs> so people are there. I'm getting in my chat window people teaching me about formula racing. So that's good. Uh, yeah, the question is, do you need the table of mu's for the test? No, I think I can. I think the, the thing is different tables might give you a different value. For, so for standardization, I think I will tell you what um, coefficients of friction I, I want you to use for the test. That's a good question. Um, and then 
Uh, Siddharth, did you want to get your hand up for a while? Hey, Professor. Yes, hi. Uh, hi. Could you just go back to the previous slide for a second? Yeah, I think so. Where's my notes? You mean this one? Uh, no, so the car one, the one where you, the, maybe it's the previous one. Yeah, this one. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. So let's say if static friction just doesn't exist, like let's say it's not a thing. Yeah. So if a car accelerates, would that mean that it would actually go backwards because there's no static friction pu pushing it forwards? Yeah, so, so it's very easy. So if the car is stationary and static friction doesn't exist, like you're on an icy surface, then when you step on the gas, the, the back wheels just sit there and the front wheels go and they accelerate around clockwise and nothing moves. This has actually happened to me lots of times in Canada. <laughs> Okay, so if so, why but why does it like so? The principle here is that because the car wants to slip backwards, the static friction puts pushes it forwards, right? Like on a normal road, yeah, kind of. Uh, it's not the car that wants to slip backwards, it's the bottom surface of the front tires, they want to slip hmm. backwards, okay, because and that's but, because these tires are rotating clockwise. They're being forced to rotate clockwise. That's the purpose of the engine. So the bottom surface, you know, all things being equal, and you know, if the car is sitting still, the bottom surface would want to slip backwards. And so therefore, hmm. static friction pushes those surfaces forwards. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Great. Awesome. Um, and then take one more right now. Uh, oops. Tian Hui? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Oh, yeah. I also want to ask about a real question. Uh, because back in high school, my teacher said uh, it's always the uh, real car, the, the real wheels are accelerating the car, and the front wheel is always not moving. Is that true? No. I think uh... It, the different cars have have different um, setups, right? Like it depends how they hook up the engine. I think most older cars did have rear wheel drive, and um, and then most newer cars, like built within the last twenty years or something, tend to have front wheel drive. And then there's things like Subarus or you know certain cars that have all wheel drive, where all four of the wheels are hooked up to the engine. Or a Tesla has all has an engine on each actually each wheel. So it depends on what kind of car you buy. But usually it'll say it's either rear wheel, rear wheel drive, uh, front wheel drive, which is more common these days, or all wheel drive. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, that's a good point. Okay. Awesome. So let's just, I, I got another announcement that I want to make here. Yeah, so this is about Friday's team up quiz. So this is actually a friend of mine just um, down in Ramsey Wright. Her name's uh, Melody Newman. She's a biology professor. Uh, she wrote an app called Team Up. Team Up lets students work together um, in class on problems in real time. So I'm going to give you a couple of quiz questions next week, but instead of you just doing it in your room, I want you to do the thing in a group. It's a free little app that runs on Quirkus. So around 1130 on Friday, all of you, I'm going to give you 10 minutes to go to your Microsoft Teams and someone should place a video call to get you guys talking to each other in your pod chat. Your first step will be to decide who is the driver because TeamUp needs a driver. Then all of you log in to Quirkus. So at this point, <laughs> you're going to have three windows open on your computer. You're going to have me over on Zoom. You're going to have Microsoft Teams where you've got your little pod chat going on. You see your friends. That's where you have to turn on your mic. And you have to have Quirkus open in your browser. So hopefully this is not going to kill your internet. <laughs> um, okay. Then you on Quirkus, you click on Team Up Quiz Module 2 and go to Tool. And then if you're the driver, if you've been elected to be the driver, you click on Create New Group and you obtain your pod's unique group ID for the session. And then over in your Microsoft Teams window, you share that ID with your friends and they type it in. And so now you're all doing the same quiz. The driver acts as the team leader and actually is the one who has to submit the answers. There's gonna be three questions. Um, and you can tell 
because they have a little steering wheel. And then the team members participate, you know, by turning on your microphones and chatting. You should all come up with a consensus before the driver submits the answer and goes forward. If the answer is correct, you get five diamonds for a correct answer. And one diamond is one homework credit. There's three questions. So you can get a maximum of 15 homework credits just for doing this quiz. If it's not correct, you lose, I think you lose two diamonds on the first and then one diamond and then one diamond. If you keep on guessing, you can, uh, you lose diamonds each time you submit a wrong answer. So, um, so I am going to also be talking about chapter five stuff, motion on a circular path. Some of this rotation stuff is going to come back. We're going to describe it more carefully. Um, plan to meet up with your practical pod during Friday's class. You should be able to turn your microphone in order to participate in this team up quiz. If you cannot do the team up quiz during class, it can be done later on your own or with your pod at a different time. It's just not going to be as fun or interactive. And I'd like to do, this is kind of like a breakout room happening during, during my lecture. So hopefully we'll be able to, to do that. Um, and chapter five is not on the midterm. We are going to be doing, we're going to be talking about chapter five on, on Friday. There's no class on Monday. And then Tuesday night, there's the midterm, but it's only covering all the chapter four stuff. It's a good question. I think I'm going to say adieu. I'm going to turn off the recording and then I'm going to look at, at the hands. So where is my recording?